While leading the way as an effective and viable element in bio-nanotechnology field, Nanogold still has its downsides. And with the focus at cancer treatment, we present nanocopper as an alternative for new strategies to enhance anti-tumor activity. Now, cancer is a major public health problem around the world. And currently the standard clinical treatments include surgery and systemic multi-agent chemotherapy. While surgery is not always accessible and chemotherapy exposes oneself to many side effects due to the multiple sessions required to be effective, Nanogol was considered as a possible solution in the drug delivery system to improve chemotherapy. Less sessions, less exposure, which it could lead to uh, little to no side effects. Now, Nanogol was considered as a possibility to improve uh, chemotherapy due to uh, being effective uh, or as drug carriers. Now, Nanogol presents an issue similar uh, to the electronics industry, which is that it's expensive and it won't be as accessible to your average uh, patient. It could go from 205 all the way to $785 per milliliter. Here's where we present nanocopper as an alternative uh, to nanogold in cancer therapy. A couple of pointers about nanocopper is that it has been proven to inhibit tumor growth uh, up to 78%. And that is due to that it's hollow particles the, diam the diameter is it's wider, it's bigger, so it can carry more drugs into the system. And also they're half the cost. And the way that we propose that this particle will be used is by loading hollowed mesophores, copper sulfur nanoparticles with artesanate and transferring. Now what these particles will do is they will uh, target tumor cells via diffusion molecular retention. And in a sense, what this is, is the movement of, indi of individual molecules through fluid. And this, this fluid will be uh, inserted into the body via pretumoral injection. And this will encourage the inhibition of tumor growth. Now, the introduction of DMR with these nanoparticles have displayed the strongest inhibition rate of about 74.8%, which also possess the property to be suitable for uh, photoacoustics imaging, which also offer a diagnostic platform which in a sense what it means is that you not only are able to treat the cancer, but you're also able to assess it as you're treating it. Part of what makes Nanogold so attractive for cancer therapy and DMR is its abilities to tie in with amine and thiol groups. Gold has the molecular structure that makes it strong enough to tie in firmly with amino acids and weak enough with thiol groups to let go of the loaded drugs in desired target areas. If we recall from our basic biology, our DNA blocks consist of amines such as adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine, hence the amino acids. Thiols are the organosulfur compound groups that are typically used for cancer drugs. Blocking the connection between amino acids can interrupt the function of the original sequence, which is sometimes the intended purposes of these drugs. Copper oxide has an oxidation state of plus one as well as plus three. Gold has an oxidation state of plus one as well as plus two. Both having shell orbitals in the S states though provides a means of compatible valence orbitals. The oxidation state of plus one used in nanogold makes copper a good substitute as well. Copper also has thermal conductivity of 385 watts per meter per Kelvin, while gold has thermal conductivity of 314 watts per meter per Kelvin. Copper has a smaller atomic radius of about 31 picometers. This means that it would increase precision in size or shape. Think about it. When trying to fill a jar to an exact shape, which would be more precise, sand or marbles? Sand would provide the means of having a big enough size to reach the desired size than any amount of marbles. With the price of copper having a lower price than gold, we can essentially follow suit of generic pharmaceuticals that use chemically similar ingredients at a fraction of the price. 
Now, all cells have something that tells it to create more cells of itself called epidermic growth factor receptors. Though healthy cells have these EGFRs, tumor cells have an excess of them. The way current photothermal therapy works is by loading EGFRs with nanovolt particles of 40 nanometers in diameter. This is small enough to get into the EGFRs, but big enough to bypass any other small structure in the cell. Yes, EGFRs in healthy cells are also penetrated with the nanogold, but nowhere near as much due to not as many EGFRs being present in as in tumor cells. Once the tumor cell is loaded, a light of about 780 nanometers in wavelength hits the nanogold, which causes a plasma on resonance to heat up the nanogold up to 50 degrees Celsius. Though nanogold in healthy cells EGFR is also heated, because healthy cells are not absolutely loaded, the healthy cells remain intact. Since nanocopper has a more manageable size and high conductivity, it is a suitable substitute to the expensive nanogold. In a study done by Hu and colleagues, nanocopper sulfide was loaded at several dosages, which included 150 micrograms and 300 micrograms. The plasmon resonance of these provided heat signatures of 20 to 50 degrees Celsius in two to five minutes. This is pretty similar to the 25 to 50 degrees provided by nanogold particles at a wavelength of 780 nanometers radiation, demonstrated by the study done by Cal and his colleagues. We understand that nanocopper requires a slightly higher wavelength, but it is less than a 14% increase in wavelength. This demonstrates that copper can be a suitable means to replace nanogold. We don't see silver wiring doing our electrical circuits in our homes, even though it is a far superior conductor due to its sizable up price. So why not bring nanocopper to replace nanogold? As we all know, gold nanoparticles is what is being used for drug delivery. However, we don't hear many cancer patients saying of this, talking about this treatment or being able to afford it due to its high cost. A potential replacement is copper nanoparticles because they have very similar chemical properties to that of gold nanoparticles. However, there is a limitation to go nano, sorry, there is a limitation to copper nanoparticles because copper nanoparticles on its own are toxic to the human body, either through inhalation, durable penetration, and ingestion. When they are inhaled, they start affecting the lung organs, which, which it starts affecting the lung cells. These, this eventually leads to DNA damage, cytotoxicity, mitochondrial damage, and it starts producing an excess of reactive oxygen species, which we will talk about in further slides. Whenever it, it goes in through dermal penetration, it goes into the skin, into the skin cells, causing, uh, causing harm to the skin, as it does to the lungs. Whenever it's ingested, it is even worse because about 15 to 25 percent of that, of those copper nanoparticles start they start, um, they stay stuck in the body and they start affecting the liver because that's where they stay stuck and the spleen, which will cause, uh, as more consumption is being used, it will cause more and more toxicity, which can lead to death. Okay, once these copper nanoparticles are in the body, they enter the cells. When they enter the cells through direct diffusion in a process called pinocytosis. Pinocytosis is a form of endocytosis. However, since these are small nanoparticles, which they are small in scale, it, therefore it is called pinocytosis. But it is basically when the, when the cell membrane is absorbing these nanoparticles, that way it can enter the cell. Once it's in the cell, it starts to interact with the mitochondria basically affecting the, the mitochondria because the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell which requires oxygen to, 
and therefore it starts generating ROSs, which are reactive oxygen species. And these oxygen species and excess of them can cause cytotoxicity, DNA damage, and self-death. Cytotoxicity is any type of venom or any type of toxic thing that goes into your body and it could be measured. Therefore, with all these nano particles that are being used for cancer treatment, they are being tested on those on the cytotoxicity. And as we know, they are very, they are very high in cytotoxicity. They since they start affecting the mitochondria, the mitochondria's DNA starts getting damaged, which affects the the main DNA in the cell, and it eventually leads to cell death. Many of these cell death can eventually lead to um, a death of a person. Another other types of biochemical reactions that occur due to these copper nanoparticles are ox oxidative stress in the cell, increased surface reactivity, and invasion of the immune system. In conclusion, nanoparticles is what is being used for drug delivery. It is a new and major expansion of bio nanotechnology. However, with Go nanoparticles, they are too expensive. Therefore, it, is, it hasn't been expanded as quickly as we would have liked. And copper nanoparticles on its own are toxic. A solution to this to these problems is hollow mesoporous copper sulfide nanoparticles, which was previously discussed by my colleagues. And basically, copper on its own, it's toxic. However, when it is combined with sulfide, it helps um, be able to not be toxic to the body and be able to attack those bad cells that or those cancer cells without affecting the healthy cells. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the presentation and thank you for watching.